will show that all five board members are present, uh, as well as one of our students, um, uh, Megan Jacobs, is excused this evening. Um, I'd ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Kiltz, is there any communication you'd like to share with the board at this time? We have a number of items to share with the board and with the community. First of all, today was the first day of the 2019-2020 school year for K-5 through 12th grades. District Services team and I had the chance to be at the opening of all of the schools this morning. Drop-off went very smoothly at all of the schools, even with construction zones set up at two of them. Uh, so I appreciate the patience and flexibility being shown by staff, students, and parents as we navigate through some of the construction. I know that air conditioning has been installed and they were um, running some tests and making sure that the air was being balanced, but I think there was only one school where they were struggling that was at College Park because they had some leaking that was going on with the system that they needed to resolve before turning it on there. I also want to thank the following parents for their participation in a panel discussion with staff during the opening session last week. Amy Ali, Rachel Bush, Becky Dyslin, Milagros Lebeau and Robert Peterson. Focus of the opening session was on the connection of the district priorities on creating more equitable classrooms and schools for our diverse learners and families. The parents shared perspectives around culture and identity to help staff better understand the importance of building relationships and recognizing strengths of students through their identity. So it was a great way to start the year. Due to the increasing enrollments for kindergarten, a decision was made to split the kindergarten classes at both Canterbury and College Park schools, as both were at 50 students. We're excited with the staff who have been added to support students at both of those schools moving forward. Construction is wrapping up this week in line with students returning to school on Monday. Air conditioning installation is complete. Electrical service transfers in all schools were done this past weekend. Crews are working to calibrate the systems early this week. Site work is done at Canterbury and Highland View schools. Furniture installations will wrap up this week at the middle school. Construction updates are posted regularly on the district website. An overview of construction work, including the timeline and maps of the new site configurations at Canterbury and Highland View will be provided to the community as a flyer in the fall park and rec book that is mailed to all Greendale homes by the end of this month. We also just got some visual renderings of the exterior at College Park that we'll be posting on the website as well. New construction work at the elementary schools and at the high school will start up in early October. So we have a little reprieve here to start the school year, which is nice as we get everyone situated. At tonight's meeting, there will be a board commendations for the staff that responded to a medical emergency this summer. So we appreciate those staff members being here as well as representatives from C.G. Schmidt. So looking forward to that tonight. The annual Jumpstart to 4K program will be held on Tuesday and Wednesday, August 20th and 21st at Highland View School. Parents are asked to call the school for an appointment. All Greendale residents, resident children ages three and four are invited to attend the Child Development Days on Thursday, August 22nd at Highland View School. The event offers important screening of your child's school readiness, including speech and language development, reading readiness, social emotional maturity, fine and gross motor skills, and vision and learning. Children are seen by appointment. There are three additional child development days planned for the 2019-2020 school year. Further information can be found on the Greendale Schools website. So you can find the other dates, three other dates there as well. The 4K Meet Your Teacher Day will be held on Friday, August 23rd from 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. at Highland View School. And the first day of school for 4K Time for Learning program and the Early Childhood program will be Monday, August 26. So we're looking forward to those little ones being in our schools here soon. Next meeting of the Community Coalition Steering Committee will be held on Monday, August 26, followed by a meeting on Tuesday, September 10th. Both meetings will be at the Safety Center and the Fire Department Training Room from 5 to 9.30 p.m. First Parent Open House of the Year will take place on Thursday, August 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. at Greendale High School. Schools will be closed on Monday, September 2nd in observance of Labor Day. College Park School groundbreaking will be held on Friday, September 6th at 3 p.m. 
And we're looking forward to the students being involved in that groundbreaking like we did at Highland View and at Canterbury. Greendale schools ranked number six in the state, number three in Milwaukee County in the 2020 niche rankings. The district also received a number two ranking for best place to work for teachers and a number one ranking for the teachers that we have in our system. So the Journal Sentinel ran a story about these rankings last week, and uh, it's always nice to receive those types of um, those rankings and recognition from outside organizations. The board's first discussion of the year will be on, at the September 9th board meeting for part one, chapters one and two of the book Bias by Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt. The following donations were received by the district. $2,000 grant was given to the high school English department from Book Love Foundation, a group that awards classroom libraries to teachers who use independent reading in their classroom to cultivate a love of reading. So we congratulate the English department on getting that grant. Greendale Community Theater donations include Manchester Investments, $1,000, Hale House LLC, $750, Veterinary Medical Associates and Grand Haven LLC, $500 donations, Panther Pub and Eatery, $480 donation, and then finally Edward Jones, Matthew Kunow, Birch's Restaurant LLC, and Colleen Lease, $250 donations, and then finally Greendale Village Concert Band donation from Thomas Sprague, of $200, so we appreciate that community support for the different programs we run across our district. All right. thank, for, thank you for the communication, Dr. Kiltz. Uh, at this time, we invite uh, residents um, to share any comments that they have with the board. Um, we welcome to all of those who will be participating this evening, and we'd like to remind uh, everyone that the school board meetings are for the purpose of carrying on the business of the district. They are official business meetings held in public. Uh, through School Board Policy 186, the Board allows citizens to make comments by scheduling two opportunities on the agenda to receive comments. And in accordance with the intent of the open meeting laws, please be aware that although the Board of Education welcomes public comments, it cannot discuss or debate items brought up during public comments. And in order to hear from all citizens who wish to speak and ensure that the official business of the district is addressed, uh, Board Policy sets a time limit for citizen comments and will be adhering to that board policy and its time limits at tonight's meeting. Persons wishing to address the board are asked to come forward to the podium and state their name and address for the record and are limited to one time. Individuals who will be speaking will be limited to three minutes or five minutes if representing a group. And citizen comments are limited to a period not to exceed 30 minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kendall Curtis. I reside at 5300 Olympia Lane in Greendale, Wisconsin. I'm here because I want to share uh, some of my thoughts with you guys so that way you guys will kind of understand where I'm coming from and, and where we're coming from as residents. I've been in the restaurant business for about 25 years. I've had 49 restaurants across the country for a long, long time. I've had restaurants all over the place and people working for me all over the place in New York and Atlanta and pretty much everywhere, Wisconsin, Chicago. And what would happen is each and every person that worked for me, before they got hired, they had to be approved by myself. Anyone that got terminated had to be terminated by myself. So that mean I, meant I had to touch every single person. And where I'm really frustrated is this. If I found out from a restaurant who knows where that there was an, uh, an issue with an employee, even the lowest level employee, I would make it my business to get to that employee and speak to that employee. What is the problem? What can I do to help? And before I would do that, I would speak to all my GMs, all my district managers. Have you spoken to this person? Have you talked to this person? What's going on? How can we eliminate this person from firing us? Because essentially, that's what a person would do, is they would fire me as their supervisor. And that's not a good thing. And that's the reason why I'm here. There's a person, Shanice Knox, that's a student at Greendale High School. Now, she had been called the N-word on a consistent, constant basis. She screamed it loud that she needed help. She said, I need help. They're calling me the N-word. She went to her teacher. She went to the principal. But here's what happened. They called the police on her. She was interrogated. Her Olympic uh, situation was eliminated. She wasn't able to do athletics or anything else. And not one person went to visit her. If that were me, I would have went to her class. I would have told her, hey, my name is Kendall. I'm here just so you know. I'm here to help. I'm here so you all know and understand that you're not in this alone. When she's a minority and she's in a school, and she's in a school where she's clearly outnumbered. Now, we've got several board members here. 
and none of you have visited her. You don't know her. You haven't went to see her. And she screamed to the rooftops, I have an issue. I've got a problem. I need help. But what did we do? We didn't do anything. You know, sometimes when we don't do anything, it speaks volumes. Because from what I heard, this, this, this particular school rated almost number one in the nation for everything. It was great. But my question is, is that rated, rated based off minorities? Was she rated? Does the nation even know that she had an issue and we didn't even cover that issue, that topic at all? If we didn't, why not? Who's telling the board members here not to address an issue with a student? Because I can tell you, if it's one person that works for me, I don't care who they are, I want to know what's going on, what did we do to prevent it, and did you go to speak to that person? And if you didn't speak to that person, well, we would end the employment relationship. That's what would happen. And I can tell you, I've had restaurants all across the country, and I've never allowed any person to leave my, my restaurants or my businesses at all. And I don't know what's going on. So what that tells me is that maybe we do know what's going on. And maybe because she's a minor, we decided, well, we don't need to worry about her. We can just do whatever we want. Maybe because she's a minority. We can just do whatever. We can do whatever we want because we're number one in the nation for schools, academics, and everything else. We're number one. But you know what? I wonder if that's accurate. Because maybe we're number one based off a majority population. She's a minority. How many minorities actually go to Greendale High School? Have we went out to recruit minorities to come to this particular high school? Are we saying to the nation, we're number one, but guess what? We don't have any minorities that come to this school that we even respond to, even if they have an issue. Now, I, I'm wondering, what is it that a, an, an individual has to do to get recognized and get help? You see, I've been in restaurant business for almost 25 years. I've had restaurants all over the country, and it started long ago well, one person came to me and straightened me up and said, well, Kendall, let me show you something. So you can be successful. It took one person to show me this is the way things happen. Results are not driven by results. Results are driven by people. Don't we know that? I, I know that we're clearly I'm going to mention that your three minutes are coming to an end, so if you can finish your statement. I understand I'm, I'm coming you. to a close. I clearly understand that results are driven by people. And I know that you guys understand it because you guys are all very smart. We're number one in the nation. But I can, I, I can assure you that no one has been to visit Janice Knox. No one has been to her classroom to check her out. No one has done anything for her at all. Now, I know Joe is the president, and he's the leader. So you're, you're running the show, and you would know if they visited her or not. So maybe you're OK with that, and that's why she hasn't been visited at all. Maybe you guys need to understand, as board members, you have a responsibility. You were chosen for a reason. You were chosen to step up for these students when they can't step up for themselves, and that's what we're here. That's what PACE is all about. We step up for the people that can't stick up for themselves. So as a board member, you don't need Joe's permission to step up and say, this ain't right. We need to fix this. You don't need his permission. And if you do, you need to say something. And if you're not saying anything, why? And I'm going to ask you to finish your statement now. Well, I can tell you. I'm finished with my statement. I'm lucky because I'm grown and I've already succeeded what I wanted to succeed in. But Shanice Knox certainly hasn't. And she probably won't. Because I think she's fired us. I don't think she's going to continue going to Greendale High School as a result of none of you guys reached out to her at all, especially you, Joe. So you should know that. So she's fired me. She's fired all of us because we've let her down and we failed her as a board. So I'm in closing. I'm going to close, Joe. Please. And so is she. She's going to close as well because we failed. Understand that. We're number one in the nation, but we couldn't take care of one student. And with Thank that, I close. Thank you. And I've mentioned it at previous meetings. At a public session like this, we do not discuss individual student um, issues. Um, a public session is not an appropriate um, venue for conversations you know you know what i i we need to move on i never we asked you to discuss her personal we, issue at all i discussed it and i got permission and i just want to mention that and we're going to continue on thank you mary grogan 4962 sutton lane um i'm here uh with kind of a, a lighter topic my 78-year-old uh, father was cleaning out his basement, 
and he found some letters dated 1980 and 1991 from William Knapp. So, and they also uh, talk about Julie Schweitzer and my mom, who was on the re the representative for the um, Park and Rec. So I. I just brought them. I'm sorry I didn't make copies for the whole board. I thought maybe if you Vice share President Comiskey would like them. Or, or, or you can share them with Miss Jacobson, and she'll make sure that the rest of the There we go. I it. will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Holly. Um, Holly Curtis. Um, I live at 5316 Olympia Lane. I am with the um, Page Group again. Um, parents advocating for Greendale uh, equality. I'm here to discuss a few ideas for the schools. Um, we would like to um, excuse me, <laughs> expose the, the children um, and some diversity and to make it a learning experience and to have fun with it. So what I'm doing is proposing a multiple culture events throughout the school year for the kids to help them through diversity. Um, pretty much our objective is to teach our children at a young age a variety of culture and historical events and also ex historical figures um, for people that live outside Greendale and around the world. Um, so what we're proposing is such events such as celebrating African American history, taking children, all grades, to the Black Historical Museum, which is located in Milwaukee. Um, we also have, of course, Black History Month, which doesn't seem like was celebrated last year, um, which is in February. So we're hoping that the um, children are able to do um, a paper or an essay, um, research at a library for historical figures, and also excluding well-known figures that seem to be put out there, and they only want to learn about Martin Luther King, Barack Obama, Malcolm X, and Rosa Parks. So we really want the kids to dig deep, 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 I'm sorry, dig deep into um, the library to find um, black inventors, leaders um, that changed the world and probably present them to their class. Um, for like 4K and 5K, they can also learn about black history through art, um, music. Um, other things that could happen is we can have nightly events um, exposing the children to um, music, dance, um, and and different types of food. Um, there also is National His, um, His, Hispanic Month, which is actually happening the 15th of September through October 15th. Um, once again, the same kind of situation um, so the kids can get some kind of exposure to diversity um, and also go on field trips. There's a place called the Latino Arts Center, um, which is located in Milwaukee, which they have um, several um, things that you can do, experience educational um, programs for the kids. Um, and there's other programs for the Asian community, which the um, schools can also celebrate. That happens in May. There's also National um, Native American Month, which happens in November. Once again, the same situation, exposing them to the music, the food, the culture, um, and also Middle Eastern um, Month, which happens in April. Um, I did uh, make copies uh, for you guys. Um, it has information about how to get in touch with these people. Um, I did this when I went to um, MPS, and it was a very interesting experience. You learned a lot about cultures, what people ate, um, what regions of the countries they came from, and things like that. And then trying to do a paper, even though the kids were kind of upset that they couldn't learn about Martin Luther King, because everybody in class wanted to pick Martin Luther King and come to find out there's so many other people out there that have invented things um, and, and stuff like that. There's the first black lady that flew around the world. She was actually almost like, um, what's her name? That she disappeared in the Pacific. What's her name? Amelia Earhart? Yes. Oh. Well, there was a black lady that did the same thing. She didn't disappear, though, so that's good. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there's certain things like that, which I think will help with the diversity. Um, I think kids are, at, especially in elementary school, are very interested in other people, um, especially if they haven't been exposed to someone. So they want to know, um, even with the high school kids, um, especially if there's, we're having so many problems, this will help them learn about other people and their different backgrounds. Um, so I'll just give this... If you could leave them with Ms. Jacobson, she'll make sure that we all get one. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your feedback and your comments.
So I'll be reading an open letter to Greendale High School. Your racism is showing. I sent this to every board member. Of course, I heard not back from not one person. So maybe you didn't read it. So I will read some of it to you. Next month will mark one year since Chinese Knox was the victim of a verbal assault by another student using a racial slur. One year since she was verbally stood up for herself. One year since the cops were called and threatened to arrest her. One year since you've done nothing to deter the present and the future actions of racist students who roam your very hallways at your beloved Greendale High School. Instead of remedying the situation with wisdom, you chose to criminalize the victim. A victim who did nothing wrong, unless one considers expressing basic human emotion at being called an N-word a crime. There is a history in this country of white people attempting to limit what black people could do, could accomplish, could feel, could say. It is the lifeblood of racism and white supremacy to which you are readily contributing by displaying those same attitudes, whether knowingly or unknowingly. It's being told to calm down when you're being accused of something you didn't do of something that doesn't warrant justifiable accusations. It's being told that you're overreacting. If you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. Zora Neale Hurston. Your logic is that she should have just ignored her and walked away, that there would have been no problem after that. Your logic clearly exhibits the flaws belief that because she did not walk away, she should be arrested. Understand something, you do not get to dictate how a black student verbally express herself after being called an N-word by a racist student. Furthermore, you knew about the prior episodes when Chinese was called the same derogatory name by the same person, but you did nothing to punish the offender. What you allow, you encourage. One must possess an extraordinary amount of societal and moral disinterest to tell a person who ex who has experienced racism, who is pleading with the faculty, the school board, to do something to help them, to respond in essence. We'll have to think about it and get back with you. Give us about a year, maybe more. We'll see. Your privilege allow you to do that. Superintendent Gary Kilch, you are especially complicit. If you aren't, what policies have you drafted to help eradicate racism occur within your school? Do something. Do your job. The old folks back home used to say, poop or get off the pot. Your privilege allows you to posture it. It allows you to release a statement including some variation of off-used, seldom-followed mantra which black people are all too familiar. Racism and discrimination have no place in our organization. I am positive under the current administration nothing will change. I am asking the community to stand for what is right. We cannot allow another student to be mistreated. There is a race problem in this district, and it will not go away because some say it's fake news. In the end, Greendale School Board will not be remembered by their words, but by their lack of action. That's what I stated several months ago. And from this letter that was written by somebody, it holds true. In fact, they protested only to be met with opposition, which must be expected. What was not expected was the opposition would be from the very ones tasked with protecting them. You, your board members, the faculty, the detective, the police officer, you are all complicit. You all should be held accountable. Justice will not be served unless there are substantial professional consequences for your judgment in relation to this situation. We know you cannot talk about it, but you could do something about it so another student doesn't have to go through this. At this point, Chinese would not be returning to Greendale because I cannot trust you to keep her safe, mentally or physically. You have failed her as have you failed other students in this school. As a parent, I don't know how you sleep well at night. I don't know how you can go to bed knowing how you damaged one student, how you mentally damaged and told her who she is doesn't matter. Greendale is known for a lot, and now we can add racism. Thank you for your comments. Any other comments this evening? Seeing none, we'll continue on with the agenda. Um, and first item on the agenda is some commendations. And as Dr. Kiltz mentioned, 
uh, we had a medical emergency this past summer at the middle school during construction. And uh, during summer school at the middle school, one of the construction workers from C.G. Schmidt experienced a medical emergency that required the help of the paramedics. Uh, and thankfully, school nurse Amanda Smith responded immediately with uh, the physical education teacher, Phil Lamb, who was right behind her helping out. Uh, and due to their quick action of starting CPR and then using the AED devices, the construction worker's life was saved. So each of our schools are in the, or, I'm sorry, each of our schools have an AED. Uh, a special thank you to Amanda and Phil for responding so quickly and professionally, and to our college park teacher, Stephanie Uden, for contacting the EMS um, quickly. Uh, these types of critical situations happen very infrequently, and when they do, it's great to know that our staff is prepared. So I believe we have representation from C.G. Schmidt here this evening, who may want to say some, a few words? It, either way, okay, please. Well, I'd be happy to. My name is Rick Schmidt. I'm the president and CEO of uh, C.G. Schmidt. And the gentleman that you're uh, talking about is sitting uh, behind me in the chair here. And he certainly wouldn't be uh, with us today if it wasn't for the, the quick thinking and the quick action of your teachers here at Greendale. So we're incredibly uh, grateful um, to those who came forward and helped him. And uh, we certainly, you know, appreciate those efforts because it's a, it's a minor miracle that he's still alive with us and as one of our employees you know we value him just like we value the rest and uh, so thank you to those people that came forward and helped thank you for being here this evening at this time I'd like to invite uh, Amanda uh, Phil and Stephanie and congratulations
and thank you again to everyone uh, this evening. Moving on to the business portion of our meeting, um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the regular meeting minutes. I move approval of the regular me mini meeting minutes of August 5th as outlined in agenda item 1.1. 1 .1. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Um, any further discussion? Then I call for a roll call vote. Yes. 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 And I'm yes, motion carries. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, the financial report. Um, so monthly financial report through the month of July. So now we're into the 1920 fiscal year. Um, revenues were under 1% because uh, we're very early on. We haven't received state aid payments or most of our student fee payments at this point. Um, our expenses were at 7.89%. That's um, about um, where we would expect to be one twelfth of the year through. Um, and then in terms of the 2018-19 school year, we have our audit coming up. So that will start next Monday um, when our audit team will come in. And we're at 99.9% .9 of revenues and expenditures. So right now we um, have a, a, an increase to fund balance of 19750 for the 18-19 school year. So on a $30 million budget, it's pretty close, um, but right on with where, where we should be. All right. Any further questions? Right, then I'm looking for a motion to approve checks and disbursements for the month of um, July, August. I make a motion to approve total amount of checks and disbursements uh, in the amount of $5,268,229.50 as shown in agenda item 2.2. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve agenda item 2.2. Uh, any further discussion? Then I call for a roll call vote. Yes. 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 And I'm yes. Motion carries. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, approval of personnel. So there are a few teacher appointments, both full-time and part-time, that are happening late in the year um, based on um, staffing needs. And, and you heard a couple of the uh, needs at the, at the elementary schools. Anything more from administration? No, the, the full-time position is for one of those kindergarten positions where we opened up a section, and then the other two are part-time positions, a part-time math teacher at the high school, and the part-time business education teacher at the high school as well. Right, any questions or discussion? Then I call for a motion um, to approve. I move approval of the part-time teacher appointments and full-time teacher appointment as outlined in agenda item 4.1. A second. There's been a motion and a second to approve personnel. Any further discussion? All right. Then I call for a roll call vote. Yes. 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 And I'm yes. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda um, is the food service report. So this is an annual report, and I will invite Cindy to either the podium or the, the table probably is more comfortable uh, to share this annual report with us. So as Cindy's getting ready, um, just want to say uh, I've been in the district for a short while, um, but uh, really grateful to have her on our team um, and know that she's now completed four years as food service director. Um, and based on her work, um, her leadership, um, her ability to listen and care for her team members, um, she was honored to receive the Employee of Merit Award. Um, this this past week during our opening in service, but because she's so dedicated <laughs> and we were working on this report um, She was not part of the all staff um, Celebration so in recognition just would want to give her a round of applause for her efforts Ready yeah. we're ready. ready You can go to page two Jonathan. Yep um, each year we talk about the standard keys um, for financial indicators used for the food service department. With the financial presentation to the school board being moved to August, we're able to give a more accurate report by applying them to Greendale at the end, um, as of the end of June. Um, some of the key performance indicators that we use are food cost, participation rate, and the financial position. Um, this next slide is non-labor costs. Um, each year we talk about how to reduce food waste. One of the ways this is possible is by implementing a cycle menu. Um, Greendale, I implemented a cycle menu um, about five years ago with Greendale. Uh, a cycle menu is where all menus repeat themselves. We do it every four weeks. Um, the benefits of the cycle menu are as follows. Time and labor cost savings, 
uh, food cost savings, reduced storage waste or reduced storage cost, reduced food waste, and improving of staff prep skills. Required professional standards continues with refreshment courses on portion control, the proper equipment and measurements to use during service, and their accuracy of production records. I will also be bringing in vendors to teach staff skills, um, such as knife, uh, knife skills. Um, we had a chef last year come in and teach <coughs> um, uh, like bar items, where you can incorporate one food item and expand it into a, a Build-A-Bar. Uh, we continuously revamp the menu components to meet the needs of our students, but also continue to be compliant with the guidelines. Uh, nine labor costs, as you can see, for 1819, uh, the total costs for non labor was uh, $305,268. Um, that was about $3,000 less than last year. Meals served, we were up about 5,000 meals served from last year, which brought our non labor cost per meal down to $1.33 per meal. And can I just, this is for just the school year, or does this include the summer or, or lunch just or the um, breakfast? Year. Does it well, it's breakfast? in breakfast as well. Okay. It's actually breakfast, a la carte. Um, catering, okay. and then lunch program. All right, thank you. Um, participation rate. Uh, enrollment divided by student uh, purchased meals. Um, we continue to seek out what drives the students elsewhere versus purchasing an affordable, healthy, complete meal here at, here at school while still meeting the regulations. With the new administration, there are three authorized flexibilities in the meal program for the 2019-20 <coughs> school year. One of them, um, for the National School Lunch Program and the Breakfast Program, we're now allowed to offer um, flavored 1% milk. In the past, all flavored milk had to be skim. Uh, the other uh, change is that we can now offer 50% of our grains to be regular grain instead of whole grain products. And then the sodium guideline was supposed to go down again this year, but they're keeping the target sodium rate as is which is good because it's a challenge to meet the sodium guidelines that they were going to implement. I, as a director, I'm going to decide not to, not to change the milk consumption to go to 1% um, flavored milk because I'm afraid that with administration changes, they may go back and it's harder to get them to change back to something than it is to go forward. So I'm going to leave everything as is. I am going to implement though 50% whole, uh, 50 non whole grain products. Uh, for instance, rice, noodles, um, and some of the breads will be um, regular white instead of whole grain. Uh, productivity. Uh, meals per labor hours. Uh, one of the tried and true ways to look at, at productivity is meals per labor. We gather information on labor scheduled for the school and divide by meals served with dividing a la carte by three um, additional meals counted. So every a la carte item, every three a la carte items we sell can be counted as one meal. Remember that the high school prepares the meals for the elementary and does all the catering, um, thus increasing hours. Uh, we have, um, we've stabilized on hours. Uh, we've gone down actually on meals per labor hours except for Highland View. Highland View's participation last year increased tremendously, uh, which was really good to see. Uh, what the financial, uh, financials say, uh, local, local sources for 2018-19 uh, are local sources, which is um, money that the students put into their accounts. Um, that's gone down about $23,000, $24,000. State and federal sources, uh, that's the um, reimbursement we get from the state. That's gone down. And then, uh, total revenue has gone down about $24,000. Um, current profit and loss, uh, the end of June, uh, our revenue was at $861,295. Our expenditures were $866,087. That created a $4,792 loss for 18-19, but our fund balance still remains at $316,423. While we're happy to have a fiscally viable fund balance, federal, federal regulations limit net cash resources to the amount not to exceed a three-month average of operating expenditures. Our net accounts increase, our negative lunch balances um, increased by $23,924 last year. The, the thing I was working on when I 
was supposed to be getting the Merit Award was this report. <laughs> we took, um, I went to the first day of school last year and added all the negative fund balances that we had in the district to the last day of school last year, and that's where the difference is. Um, currently, we carry about a $39,000 negative lunch balance threshold, um, and that's because of the fact we don't deny students meals. Um, funds in the nonprofit food service account can only be used for school, foods, school, for school food service activities. The reason for the loss, I believe, is because of the negative fund balances that we have that we're carrying right now. So, Cindy, I think to step back one second, you yeah. mentioned in the slide before our local sources went down about $22,000. And so for, for meals where we extended um, those negative balances, essentially then we didn't receive um, revenues for that. Mm -hmm. And so that increased by about, we said about 23,000, which was a substantial increase right. in the negatives for 1819. Um, the next slide is uh, cash balance from nonprofit food service account. Um, our, our, uh, balance, our fund balance exceeded the three month um, allowable average that the, um, the DPI allows us. Uh, we could only have three months of um, Allowable, <laughs> allowable funds in our in our fund balance to how do you explain that Jonathan to carry yeah so three months of operational expenses so one of the things that they want to make sure you do is because you're receiving federal reimbursements for students that qualify for free and reduced lunch and you get a small amount for paid meals as well they want to make sure that those dollars are being reinvested into the program um, so you should be over time spending down that fund balance in some way. You may accumulate it because you're going to make larger capital investments, and that may be a conversation that we'll have as we work um, through the construction next steps and we're upgrading um, kitchen space. You can make larger investments, um, but those dollars should get reinvested um, because you want to continue to improve the program in some fashion. You don't want to just, you wouldn't want to continue to um, accumulate that fund balance and not invested into the program. And what you do is if you exceed your fund balance, you get a letter from the DPI in March and they give you, um, it's about eight weeks to, to give them a, a reasonable explanation of what you're going to be doing with the fund balance. Um, they can approve or deny what you choose to use your money for. Um, this year what I did is I, I, sent, I sent in, we had a $29,421 overture that, they, that we had to spend. Um, so what we did is um, we're getting some new equipment at the middle school so the middle school can do more of their own prep um, so their vegetables and such are, are fresher. They can make them five minutes before line instead of several hours before line. Uh, the other thing is at the high school here, uh, we have two brand new, um, a 65 inch and a 43 inch TV monitors that are hanging in the serving line. Along with that goes a, it's called meal viewer. Um, all the meals will be viewed on these TV screens when the, the students enter the serving area. So all the meals will be um, put on there. We can also put on their um, school announcements. We can put on their sporting highlights, uh, the weather. I mean, there's a whole um, plethora of things that you can put on this program. I'm still learning it. So uh, if you ever come in the high school, um, take a look at that. I know Dr. Kilt saw it today, the little welcome I had on. I got that far. <laughs> um, the other thing is we have a new um, open air cooler at the high school. Uh, what this does is it's allowing us to display some of our products better, in specific the um, bistros that we make for the sandwiches. It's a grab and go. <laughs> That's really popular with the high school kids. Uh, and we're getting a new um, serving line for the high school. Uh, it will involve no more steam, um, new design on the front. Uh, it'll be um, it'll be less on labor, or not less on energy. So that's on order. It's coming. Um, it's being fabricated by a company that's um, inundated right now with schools getting new equipment. So I'm hoping to have that by the middle of September. Um, and then uh, the, the the new meal, the new um, the meal viewer that we have for the screen that was a purchase as well as our new menuing system for the families. Um, our new menuing system is called NutriSlice. It's available on our district website. Families can go on to it and it's interactive. Um, they can click on uh, any specific menu item. 
uh, get the calories, um, all the nutritionals for it, the carbs for Amanda, all the allergens, and then um, as the school year goes on, I'll have pictures of all the products and they'll incorporate the actual product on the menu. Um, so hopefully families will utilize that um, as we get the word out that it's available. Uh, and that pretty much takes care of the fund balance for this year and then um, we'll see what happens for next school year. Um, so where we're at now, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the pieces of information that I got while I attended the School Nutrition Association State Conference this summer was that I found out that two of our schools, Highland View and College Park, uh, they qualify for severe need breakfast. And what that means is that um, schools are eligible for severe need um, breakfast based on severe need reimbursement if it's 40% more of the students um, that eat lunch are served at the schools the preceding year um, that are served free or reduced meals. Um, severe need payment is made on an individual school basis and what that does is it gives us an additional 37 cents per breakfast that we're served at that, those two schools. Um, and that's for every student that eats, not just for the free and reduced students. It has nothing to do with how many children qualify for free or reduced. It's just how many children that are free and reduced participate in the program. Um, DPI was very um, complimentary about this because this is really tough to do. Um, so it'll bring an additional 37 cents per meal served. Uh, with that, I'm going to try um, with a couple different measures on increasing breakfast participation. Um, Highland View right now is serving, they're serving approximately 65 breakfasts a day. Well, with having over 300 students, that's not acceptable. Um, so with advertisement, uh, letting parents know that they, if they're free, they qualify for free breakfast. If they're reduced, they qualify for reduced breakfast. Just getting the word out about our breakfast program and getting rid of the stereotype that breakfast is only for the, um, the, the daycare kids or that it's only for free and reduced students. Uh, the next slide then is um, registered dietitian. Um, we continue to uh, work with registered dietitians from Mount Mary University. Um, this year, they're a little bit um, slow on responding because we started school so early. <coughs> so I think that in the next couple of weeks, I'll be getting a call about getting an intern from them again. Um, the next slide is about the school garden. The school garden, we always try to feature that because of what they do for the food service program. Um, but this year, the big highlight for the school garden was um, Eric, my chef, and I, we post on Facebook a lot of pictures from the school garden, a lot of pictures, and we do it on a Facebook site that's nationwide. One of our vendors, or one of, one of the vendors that um, a lot of school districts in the country deal with, uh, saw a lot of the pictures and posts that we did for it. So what she did is she contacted me and she wanted to know if she could feature Greendale Garden in an article that she was writing about gardens. Of course, I said <laughs> yes. Um, I connected her with Heidi and with Carla and Eric and myself, and we gave her many pictures um, and a lot of different um, highlights of the garden. Uh, and it came out into a newsletter, and this letter, uh, newsletter was, um, it's called GVM Marketing. Um, this newsletter went out to every food service director in the nation. Uh, so Greendale really made it on the charts with the garden for that. Um, so now I'm getting calls from other school districts on how did you start it? What do you do with the produce? Um, just a lot of questions. So between all of us, um, we're featuring the garden a lot. And uh, Eric, um, he's uh, creating new recipes now with stuff from the garden. Uh, this year the garden so far has been pretty slow. I think it's going to start um, getting um, more productive in the near couple weeks. Um, but if anybody has a garden, mine is slow right now too. So, And then uh, the goals that we have in food service this year, it says currently the negative lunch balance for the district, or the, the negative lunch balance is it's $33,970. With a policy in the district, um, it is my plan to continue to work with these families on reasonable ways to decrease their debt by setting up payment plans. Also, food service will make sure eligible students apply for free and reduced meals instead of not applying and creating a debt that they can't afford to pay back. 
Um, currently, breakfast participation is at about 28%. I'd like to increase this to at least 50% by promoting the program, sending home information about the breakfast program home to parents, present information about the school breakfast at open house, and holding events during breakfast, such as raffles and contests. And also, Greendale, um, I would like to propose that Greendale possibly start a summer lunch program. Um, right now, I, one of my interns that I had, um, she was an employee of mine this last school year. Uh, she's from Ohio. She unfortunately moved back to Ohio. But her final um, report is on um, the summer lunch program in Greendale. Uh, so what she's currently doing is she's reaching out to students and families who participated in the summer lunch program to see their want or need for it. Um, I have yet to, to find out. This actual report from her is not due until her end of next school year um, for her college year. So we'll find out where that's at and possibly bring that to the table in the future. And then uh, negative lunch debt. Uh, reduce the current balance of the $33,970. The increase of the $23,924 during the 2018-19 um, school year. Increase from current participation rate of 28% and then invest possibly in bringing in the summer lunch program. Any questions? First of all, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, thank Great thank report. You. Any um, questions? Or, or, and, yeah, and Emma, too, if you have any questions or, or comments. But Kathy, I think. <laughs> sure. Have I, I have a question, and I, I think it's um, uh, interesting and, and probably a good thing that we explore the summer lunch program. Um, I'm assuming that would coincide with summer school then for Correct. students? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then would students from the community be allowed to also come in that are not taking summer school or is it just Actually, it's beyond the community. If you offer a summer lunch program, you have to offer it to anybody, um, the community and beyond. In fact, one of the requirements that I have is that prior to summer school starting, I have to advertise, um, actually Kitty helps me out with that, um, it has to go out to the families of Greendale to let them know where the closest summer lunch program is available to the community. And it happens to be Greenfield um, Meadowview, Maple, Maple Grove. Grove. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have to advertise where the where it's available to families. Um, the downfall with it is that because Greendale doesn't have a severe, uh, severely high free and reduced um, threshold, the summer lunch would be the same cost as what uh, regular lunch would be for the students. Um, so I'm afraid that with the negative balances we have, it could create more. Um, but the only, the, a lot of the school districts, Greenfield and South Milwaukee um, in particular, their summer lunch is 100% free because of their negative, or their, their uh, free and reduced, part their, uh, their participation that they've got. Um, so they're, for summer lunch with them, they're serving about 400 students a day. Um, and it actually is the age zero to 18, that's who can eat. Um, adults can eat for $1.50. And so I'm assuming this has to be pre-registered so you know what kind Correct. of uh, quantities to make. Well, no, it doesn't have to be pre-registered. No. We would go, it's kind of a, um, it's a forecasting. You start out at a certain amount and then you either increase, increase or decrease based on uh, the participation that you've got. So in the beginning, it could be a lot of food waste um, or you could carry over to the next day and do leftovers um, that way. Uh, but by having this... Um, this uh, survey that she's doing to find out the interest, that could help a little bit too. So far, it's not too much on our side. So we'll see what happens after summer school's over. So it sounds like that's something that you'll explore this next school year in Definitely. anticipation. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Do we have any, um, I know we have a large uh, negative fund balance or negative balance on the school lunches. Do we have any reasons for that or has there been any we do, um, we, they get robocalls every Monday. Uh, I do letters bi-weekly if the family, if I feel necessary, otherwise they get letters monthly. Um, the district office has done attempt to collect letters. Uh, the district, um, when Todd was here, Todd did personal phone calls. Um, at the end of the school year, uh, Jenny Calhoun did personal phone calls. Um, we've done everything right now possible without the exception of sending them actually to collection. So um, Dr. Kiltz and I had talked about it uh, last week and 
that may be the route that we're going to have to go um, after maybe three attempt to collect letters. Because uh, some of the families have been on here for years and they just keep, they just keep um, building the balance and building the balance. The worst that I can think of off the top of my head is a graduate student um, and she was almost $1,000. Hmm. But without, having, without being able to deny them and they take breakfast and lunch every single day and make no effort to pay, it just keeps building. And like you said, you will help them if they qualify for free and reduced lunch. You will help them or provide the paperwork and make sure that they're aware of that. Um, the downfall is, is that if they fill out a free and reduced application, we can't wipe out the debt that they've already incurred. It goes forward. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so what I've done um, with this first school day being today, the families received letters stating any family that was $100 or greater um, just stating um, you're starting the year off in a negative. The negative doesn't get wiped out. Please make a call to make payment arrangements or some effort to pay the bill. So, but I haven't heard anything because it just went out. Any other questions? Thank you. Anything you're doing with kind of feedback loops from the students around the food options and other things that you're exploring? I'm sorry? Food, are you, are you doing anything with feedback loops from the students around the things that you're exploring? As um, yeah, for this we, year? Do. Uh -huh. we do taste testing. I did some surveys at the end of last school year to find out what they're interested in. Also in the morning, I'll stand um, by the breakfast at the high school and just watch what the kids are bringing in. Unfortunately, most of it I can't compete with because um, it's all the <laughs> caffeinated coffee beverages and such. Uh, but we do the best we can, uh, like Chick-fil-A. We can compete with that a little bit. Uh, McDonald's not so much, but it's the Starbucks and the, um, the Quick Trip and all that that we just can't compete with. Um, but yeah, we've done surveys and a lot of it, some of it we can try this year because of the whole grain, um, the waiver a little bit. <coughs> we'll see where that goes. Got it. Emma, I have a question for you because you're a student here. Um, what are your thoughts on the lunch program and uh, uh, anything you have to add, I guess? Um. <laughs> I guess I've never heard any complaints <laughs> about um, school lunches. I know the bistro boxes are super popular, yeah. salad, like the salad boxes and everything. Um, I think kids get really like excited, at least people that I talk to, about like hearing about where their food is coming from, like from the garden or whatever. Um, I, I always get really interested about like, oh, the carrots are from the garden today or something like that. Um, but yeah, I don't have any complaints. I personally pack my lunch, so <laughs> yeah. All right, any other questions or comments? What is the role of the di dietitian intern? What, what, is, a, what does she here, provide? They're here on a management, actually, their management level. They have three rotations that they need to do. One is community service, one is management, and one is clinical. Um, so they come here on a management end. So then what I do them is I just show them a day in the life of the food service director. Okay. And then some are here for four weeks, some are here as long as eight weeks. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting. They, have, uh, they come in with uh, a lot of misconception about what food service is all about in schools. Okay. And they leave with an uh, eye-opening experience. And I've had, I've had four now and um, two are in school nutrition, so, <laughs> yeah. Any um, other questions or comments? Would you ever consider having like a high schooler come and have, have a similar experience? Maybe Definitely. talk to mm -hmm. a s student who's I would going love that. to be a I would actually love yeah. that. Yeah. I would have more than one. <laughs> 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 yeah. Cool. Are you willing? <laughs> Um, not me personally, <laughs> but I'm sure there are students who are interested. Yeah. Great. Great idea. That is a great, great. idea. All right. Th thank you for coming this evening. Um, I, I, I think, you know, you've, you've done a great job with the program. It was thank nice you. to have you recognized uh, this past year mm -hmm. uh, with Employees of Merit. Uh, I, I just want to also acknowledge that not only are you here for the schools, but you're also here for the community. You know, if the Lions Club or the Scouts organization or if, if they're hosting events here, uh, your staff and, and, and oftentimes yourself are here supporting that, so that's, yep. mm -hmm. th that's nice. And, and I know um, that's an industrial kitchen, so I mean, it's, it's not as if people can just walk in there and use things on their own. I know sometimes community members get concerned about not being able to do that, but right. it's 
this your kitchen it's industrial ki kitchen um, so you you share that piece with the community um, very nicely I get that across and it's like if they don't understand if it breaks it's the government paying for the repair right not the school district right. so yeah but thank you <laughs> yeah, thank you thank, thank you, you for Cindy great job <coughs> all right continuing on with the agenda um, next on the agenda uh, we're here to um, receive the curriculum review on the art um, curriculum so we heard earlier this year um, music and now we are uh, returning for the art we'll hear it this evening and then we'll bring it back at our next board meeting for uh, approval the the art team is a small team of teachers we have four teachers on that team who teach kindergarten through 12th grade art um, and the team convened this year to have some conversations about um, the goals of the program and what shifts may need to happen uh, what you have in the packet is a scope and sequence of um, the standards and the projects that they're looking to do. They did not give um, detailed every student will make X or Y, but you see genres of work and artists that will be studied. Uh, by and large, the elementary school used to have some digital projects included, but given the amount of technology and the amount of screen time that our students are having at the elementary level, they have chosen to focus almost exclusively on 2D and 3D art that is different medium, not digital medium. So you'll see painting, you see ceramics, you see um, stamps and printing materials that they're exploring. So they're exploring a lot of materials and uh, researching historical artists, different um, artists from different cultures uh, in, at the elementary level. In the middle school, uh, there begins to be more of a balance with some digital products and some um, paint, ceramics, et cetera, projects. But they definitely have some more um, products. Or they have some, they're creating more using digital tools, including photography on computers and laser cutting um, is being introduced in the curriculum this with this cycle. And then one of the significant conversations that was had by the team is that our current eighth graders art is an elective and they were looking to potentially align that eighth grade art curriculum with the art foundations at the high school and art foundations one is a prerequisite to almost every other art class at the high school. So there is conversation and they are working to uh, align their curriculum so that next year they can offer eighth grade art for high school credit in much the same way that we do for Spanish, algebra, um, and health. So they're looking at that elective credit to encourage students to engage uh, in art as a potential career. And finally, what you see at the high school is we are working on a career pathway that is media communications and the art team is involved in the <coughs> development of that career pathway project, um, looking to serve in the digital arts around media, photography, um, and video. So um, they've provided a scope and sequence, and I can answer some questions, and then I will bring them back to you to answer the questions that I cannot answer. Uh, being the first day of school, they all had difficulty getting to the meeting tonight. So. Right. What questions are there? I had a question and a thought. Okay. <laughs> so one of my thoughts was around, um, especially the high school students, and knowing that the elementary school is not going to have any of the digital components. But I know that, for example, my daughter in first grade was doing PowerPoints and doing different images and pulling stuff together. So they're doing that early on um, with the new... Uh, academy that's kind of being put together perhaps maybe we can even leverage that to have them create tools and resources that can be used even though it's not an art class for the elementary students which would be an interesting learning experience because they've obviously somewhat recently gone through some of those programs so that was a thought around kind of making that a relevant connected piece and I'm not sure how that fits into the current scope and sequence so that was just thought slash comment slash question once it gets to you know being more finalized uh, and then the one uh, question I had was just around the essential questions in the curriculum seem to be uh, not necessarily always essential questions. They seem to be more um, around... Skill-based. Yes. And they, and they were 
very consi- they were very common and they were more written for the teachers than they were for the students. Mm-hmm. And so um, that was just a, kind of a question around, is that something that's going to be pulled in from their perspective as they move forward? And I do have some stuff I can share that might be helpful yep. for them if they want around building out essential questions. What they uh, shared is that they use what I know about what they do is they use these essential questions to create uh, learning targets. Okay. And so the learning targets are not listed within the curriculum, but the learning targets are, foca- are focused at the students. So I can statements um, with some other uh, pieces. So if you'd like, I can bring back some of the sample learning targets that they're using. Yeah, no, so I, that I was you just kind of curious. That with the was, adoption. Especially the elementary was the one I noticed the most. Mm-hmm. They, they were definitely not written for elementary students. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, so that was, I was like, okay, I don't know if I read this to my, you know, my you are or accurate. any of her friends that she would actually understand. What this was the essential about. questions are targeted at the teacher so that they know what they're trying to get at, and then mm-hmm. they're crafting learning targets that are age appropriate. So I'll bring some samples from each grade level okay. uh, for the next board meeting so you can see what they're sharing with the students to translate that essential question into kid language. Okay. I appreciate that. I just had a question about the number of uh, art teachers there are at the high school and even at the middle school. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm assuming there's one at the elementary schools or a traveling one. Oh, there are two. Okay. And so s- I just know so back and oh. There, there's two for the three dis- elementary, elementary oh, schools. Oh, two for the, th- not two at each school. Correct. I didn't think that's, that. Uh, that's why I wanted yeah, to I was like, wow. <laughs> um, but back in the day, I know that um, way back going to the 80s, that art was a very, um, popular and well received in the school and there was a national art honor society and everything like that um, so I guess I have two part question how many teachers and then you know where are we at with our art our fine arts in this in the district so um, there are four teachers district wide two at the elementary school one at the middle school one at the high school and those are visual arts we also have performing arts teachers okay. so um, we have theater arts at <coughs> the high school um, and then we have all of our music teachers which in essence but in terms of visual art and design there are four teachers um, the uh, high school is based on enrollments and it's driven by enrollment uh, given the uh, um, development of the first career pathway being around media communications we are looking to expand on that um, and to make sure that we have opportunities for students to explore the visual arts. But every student does have, as you can see in the report, 50 minutes once a week at the elementary level, and they're required to um, take art at sixth and seventh grade. So every student has exposure, and from there, it's whether or not they're electing to do it. The eighth grade aligning with the high school for high school credit is an attempt by the team to encourage more students to enroll that uh, there seems to be this drive for credit and they want to make sure students continue to engage in art and so they're offering that incentive of credited high school credited at the eighth grade level. And I was just going to add and I think we've heard this in years past where I don't want to say because of but as our music program mm-hmm. increases, and it's not just band, it's our orchestra program, it's our choral program, we have seen a reduced number of students who are then opting to take a, the theater classes mm-hmm. or opting to take the, the, um, the, the art classes. Right. So, so there is a correlation there um, that, that we have seen um, a, as our music programs. And again, it's not just band, it's all our music programs have expanded and, yeah. and drawn people. There are limited options for students. Emma, I don't know if there's anything that you yeah. have. I mean, any? limited times. They, they'd pick everything if they could. Yeah. But. Um, I would just add that outside of classes and like this, how much space you have in your schedule, I know a lot of people who are in the National Art Honor Society who can't fit an art class into their schedule and then are doing like service work um, through their art um, in that club. So. So there is still a National Art Honor. Yeah, system. great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So happy to hear that. We do also offer AP Art, um, which that is the college board approved uh, okay. syllabus. And but we have a very small number of students who participate in AP Art portfolio, uh, like three to five per year. Is it uh, self-directed? Are they pretty much on their own? Or uh, what the high school art teacher has done is she's worked with us to combine classes that make logical sense so that there's a level of independent study, but also a level of direction. So painting might be mixed with AP, AP portfolio because they're both painting 
she's working with them separately and then giving them work time and feedback and so there is an attention. avenue for those that want yes. to go on great yep what was is there a requirement for the high school for art for graduation there is no requirement for any kind of art okay. or perform and music performing arts um, visual arts there are eight electives required for graduation okay and I was that just is curious. it we do not direct beyond that because I was thinking if we did the if you if you ended up moving forward with the middle school would that potentially impact off people taking art in high school if they were fulfilling <laughs> something so okay that probably much like the universities have the essential core yeah. we have um, English math science social studies health physical education that are the required components okay. economics is one of the required social studies courses okay. and then beyond that there's eight electives and those are purely student choice okay interesting Thanks. how are the two elementary art teachers how do they cover the three schools um, they one teacher is has all of Highland View and a portion of Canterbury and the other teacher covers all of College Park and the other portion of Canterbury so Canterbury is shared and then one of them is at College Park and one of them is at Highland View and I'm assuming it's one shared room there's one room designated yes. at the elementary mm -hmm. and it's usually a shared room with music so Art is there one day and music's there a different day. And that'll change with the renovations? That's a good question. I know that they, I don't know if that, they're not, they're never there on the same day, <laughs> if that makes sense. And so um, from a supply perspective and a space perspective, they have flexible furnishings and, and it works effectively. They've coordinated and collaborated. There is a kiln at each of the elementary schools, mm -hmm. so the big issue is where that's housed and getting the um, projects in and out without breaking them before they get fired. So, but yes, I'm not sure that we'll separate their rooms. There's no need. Any other questions or comments? So, so then we will bring this back at our next board meeting to approve yes, the curriculum. Yes, with a brief, with a s short list of purchases that include some of the um, digital cutting equipment, laser printer, laser cutters and printers, a handful of things. But by and large, they have a lot of consumable supplies. But there'll be a short list that accompanies this. All right. Any other questions? Um, then we will continue on. Um, next on the agenda is the reviewing of the 2019-2020 district scorecard. So at, if you'll recall at our last board meeting, we reviewed the 2018-2019 scorecard. And then the, excuse me, the idea is to bring forward uh, this scorecard. And again, we'll bring it back at our next board meeting to, review, to approve. Um, but this is where um, we'll focus the next school year on. And um, evaluate at the end of the year where we have achieved um, the, the progress. Right. So thank you, Joe, for that uh, introductory statement. Uh, the district scorecard, the idea behind this is to really represent the goals that are, are pressing issues and challenges and priorities moving forward. So <coughs> while you may see some categories on here, you will see others removed. So for example, on our last scorecard, we had Park and Rec and the Satisfaction Survey. Because the high scores the last couple of years, that's been removed. You also on past scorecards have seen some metrics with students who are English language learners. But because again, their scores have been high, they've been proportional for the last couple of years, they're not on here at this point either. So just recognizing some of that, that we're really focusing on those key priorities where we have some opportunities for improvement based upon where we currently are. You're also noticing a different structure with this scorecard compared to what we've used the last three years. So over the summer, our administrative team had an opportunity to attend a continuous improvement conference. And one of the models shared was Ashland School District up in northern Wisconsin shared this format as their scorecard and our administrative team really gravitated to this because it's, in our mind, a simpler way to review where we are with the goals as we're going through the short cycles. So rather than sharing the A3 or the progress reporting templates that we've been sharing, 50, 60, 70 pages, what our goal is is to share this with you 
and where we are with with our metrics at the end of quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and then the target for the end of the year goal. We've also organized this around our key priorities, so the college career readiness, uh, really taking a look at our instructional practices, including uh, project-based learning, youth engagement, the career pathway work, and then the service work or service excellence from there. We're also continuing to use a scale representing a score of 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, as well as a weight around these four priorities. But the scale is going to include more of these indicators moving forward. So for example, with college career readiness, around the eight goals that we're setting, we have 20 different indicators related to those goals. And so a score of five would mean that we've hit at least 17 of those indicators, hit the mark that we're setting as the end of the year mark. Around the, the first series of district goals related to college and career readiness, we are continuing to um, look at the academic achievement of our students in reading and math as one of those indicators of college and career readiness. What we're really targeting here is um, rather than overall percent proficient, we're looking at that growth in the percent proficient. And if you remember from what I shared with you at the last board meeting, looking at the overall percent proficient doesn't necessarily tell the real story. If we have a significant number of students starting below proficiency, let's say we have only 45, 46 percent of our students who are proficient in reading at that grade level at the beginning of the year, and we increase that to 60 percent of our students, we want to take a look at the percentage of uh, the percentage point increase moving forward. So looking at that growth overall. Make sense mm -hmm. as that metric moving forward. So we're setting that for both math and reading using the uh, STAR assessment for grades one through eight for reading and then using the ACT reading from spring to spring. So looking at spring junior year to spring senior year, the growth there. So any questions about district goals one through four and some of the indicators that we listed there? So the indicators are, are not highlighted. So the first indicator is second through fifth star reading. Correct. Okay. So what we're looking at, what we did is last year we increased from 58% proficient at grade level to 72%. So it was a 14 percentage point increase. And then those indicators are what will determine whether or not goal one or goal two is successful. Right. So our, our goal that we're setting for the end of the year for that one is a 16 percentage point increase overall in our elementary schools from second through fifth grade. We're using second through fifth because that's where the reading assessment for STAR is being used. There's an early literacy assessment that's used at kindergarten first grade. And overall, our students have been making tremendous growth at kindergarten, first grade. We'll continue to monitor that, but we don't see it as a need to put on the actual scorecard. So essentially, if you look at second through fifth star reading, right now it says 15 points. So that's the base metric from last year, what we did. We had 15 points growth. We had um, 14 points, 58% to 72%. Yeah, I think you're looking. I'm looking at the you're look, thing. You're, so maybe I'm we made some revisions. Oh, gotcha. there may be a updated Sorry. one where Kim mm -hmm. this provided makes, some updates. Got it. Okay. <laughs> that that so. is very helpful to look at the right document. <laughs> Appreciate. Apologize that. No. for that. <laughs> so does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And then when you get the baseline for where we are, will that just go? In that same, that'll go in the quarter one metric, quarter so one that, right. so, so that, that base, uh, right, that'll we'll give us the starting point, and the goal will be that by the quarter three metric, that we see an increase of sixteen percent of students. Like it, okay, okay, That's great. And one thought process on this too, I like this format. Um, maybe using color coding, red, yellow, green, to kind of highlight 
That is we're on track. The intent. We're, that's why we did it this that's way. Our plan. So they <laughs> they're shaded. And if, if you go on the um, Ashland School District, you can see what it looks like. They have okay. red, yellow, green, exactly okay. like that. Stop Perfect. Light. So we can track some of that and figure out again where we need to put some attention resources with the yellow, red, and continue right. to give a thumbs up with the green that we're getting. <laughs> so district goal number five deals then with participation, in high rigor, high relevance learning opportunities. So looking at project-based learning activities, our dual enrollment opportunities for students as well as college level coursework. So our baseline base metric with this is overall percent successful participation in college level courses. At Greendale High School with a beer better, we had 53% <laughs> of our students taking those college level courses with a beer better. <clears throat> so that's, that's the baseline. We haven't set an end of year goal yet. <clears throat> But next time we share this, we'll have those indicators as well. In terms of where we can set that end of the year goal, we certainly will. If we need to collect some data, we may need to do that before sending the end of the year, end of the year goal. The other thing that Kim has put on this is the source of the data. So whether it's an EDIS custom report, EDIS is our data management system or a survey that we may be doing along with that particular goal. We'll be taking a look at engagement in two or more co-curricular activities. We want to start taking a look at percentage completing industry certifications and build that into because if we're doing the right work around college career readiness as well as purposeful, um, worthwhile work doing uh, tracking that would become important. And then we're also going to do a survey uh, with students demonstrating attributes of a graduate through the project. So we want to capture students' experiences in building these skill sets related to the attributes that we identified as part of our previous strategic plan. So we want to start gathering some information related to that as well and create a baseline related to that. District goals 6, 7, and 8 are taking a look at really the proportionality and the work we're doing around equity. And what we're looking at here is we want the growth in percentage points of students of color, students with disabilities, and students receiving free reduced lunch to be the same as or proportional to the total population. So if we're saying that um, the total population is growing by 16 percentage points, our expectation would be no matter where our students in special ed may be starting, that their growth is also those 16 percentage points. Okay, they may be starting at a different place in fall, but we still want to see at least the same amount of growth in students in, in these categories as we're seeing with our total population. Make sense? Okay. And you can see then the different areas where we're going to be tracking that uh, in the three different um, identified groups and then looking at reading, math, and then secondary coursework through grades of B or better. Will there be, uh, similar to up on the top, or the, the previous page, what we did last year? Yes. Okay. Yep. So the idea would be to, to gather that information as a base metric. Okay. Yes. So we'll, we'll have that information in there for the next meeting. I really like seeing that, and I think as we t turn throughout, you, you see similar um, goals for each of the, um, you know, college and career, youth engagement, uh, career pathways. You know, taking a look and seeing. You know, we heard earlier this evening from a community member saying, "Well, it's great that we're doing well, but when we peel back the onion and look at the different groups of students, how are we doing?" So I think this. Um, this indicates that you know we are going to continue to look overall, but then look to make sure that how are our students of color, how are our special education population, how are the free and reduced lunch um, students, are, are we proportional to, to all that? Um, and we've been we've been monitoring some of that through our other scorecards. I think this will be an easier way to yes. really mm -hmm. manage and monitor that progress. So, so I think that's that's great <coughs> to see. I'm just looking at the Ashland website, and it is really nice to see the colors on there. And um, I mean, I'm able to find everything really easy on here for us. I think that'll be helpful. But 
certainly for you guys, it'll be good. Right, right. And make the stronger connections and with the short cycle yeah. that they're doing. So we'll still ask for those short cycle documents to use as some in an internal accountability and work with teams. Um, but what you'll be seeing is this, and then they'll do a short presentation as well. So we'll continue those short presentations. Around youth engagement, the second priority moving forward, we've identified five goals. The first one being increase the percentage of students, teachers engaged in project-based learning. And so one thing we measured last year was teachers trained implementing at least one project at 62%, so continuing to increase that. But we also want to make sure that teachers feel a greater sense of confidence and competence in using the model, so really having them do some <coughs> self-assessing at the application or implementation of uh, the project-based learning uh, continuum. And then we want to do some surveying of students. Um, so through that engagement survey, measuring how the project-based learning experience for students actually is impacting their engagement and then the development of those um, attributes of a graduate as well. So that's a survey that Kim is working with uh, the curriculum um, facilitators in developing and, and rolling out so that we're able to gather that information. Another indicator of youth engagement, district goal number two is around increasing satisfaction score on the student or student engagement survey. So I shared at the last board meeting where we were around purpose and relevance, the specific questions related to that, base metric of 3.82, series of questions around sense of belonging and care. And then there were two on there that were lower scores that concerned us a little bit. One, students are kind to each other with a 3.3. Students feel safe on the bus at a 3.69. So we want to make sure we're doing some work around those two and measuring our progress around that over the course of the school year as well. And then goal three around increased participation in athletics activities. Looking at this overall at the middle school, high school, elementary school, we've got some base metrics there. But we also this year want to take a look at that proportionality as well with our students of color, English language learners, free reduced lunch and special education. With our English language learners around the college career readiness, like I said, we were seeing proportionality, we are seeing strong academic success, but with athletics and activities, we haven't really studied that. We want to make sure that we've got the same level of proportionality with our English language learners. So that's why we're building it in here and not in those other areas. And that should be filled in by the next meeting? That should be filled in as well, where we were last year. Correct. We are not able to fill in the proportionality on the athletics and activities we've had um, based on how Power School has it's not storing it, and we're changing that so that it is stored and we have historical data. But at this time, um, because it wasn't reported in the athletics report, when we rolled over the school year, the secretaries wiped out the activities, and we don't have that historical data. So we are making a change to how we store that data in Power School, but we do not have baseline data because of a data entry issue that we have. Thank you, Kim, for that reminder. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, we were not able to capture that with that historical data. Um, but the intent is to do it going forward. Right. So yeah, that the in, the that intent we do have is to make a, a change to how we're documenting yeah. activities within our, data man, our student information system so that we can maintain not only current records but historical records. Didn't, uh, wasn't it in one of the reports that we saw some of that data, though? Couldn't we look at one of those and... Yeah, if, if it's in a report, I'll go back and grab it, but it was not, I do not believe that they had the proportionality of all of those groups in last year's yeah. report. Yeah, they did the pre, they did two or three years ago, but the team did not include it in last year's report, and therefore, um, I am have, I can't recover the data. Okay. We'll see what we can yeah. find through our, through our Question report. on the participation piece. Yes. Um, I know last year we couldn't, um, cut out the part where it was one student being involved in two activities versus are we actually increasing the participation are we going to be able to do that this time? Those percentages there that you see um, for the middle school, high school, and elementary school those are unique students, not activities. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And for a percentage of teachers trained in implementing at least one project is that per semester? Is that per year? That was over the course of the year. Okay. 
this past right. year. That was over the course of last school year. And so we'll be looking to increase the number of teachers who have training. I, I just would hope it would be at least once in the first semester. But oh, that they would be trained, that they would have exposure to professional development at least once per semester? Or implementing a project implementing. at oh. least once per semester. Right. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Um, it, much, yeah. It's much to ask. I agree. We agree with that. For, oh, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Joe. I was going to say, for, for district, were you talking, going to talk about district four? I was going to okay. talk about district Please. goal number four under youth engagement and, and goal number five. So district goal number four, we know that in this district, um, music and performing arts certainly play a significant role in the lives of our families and students. And uh, we want to make sure that access to those performing arts are available to all of our students. So while we know we have a high percentage, one thing that we haven't necessarily taken a look at is that proportionality. And so we think that that's going to be important in these four categories as well. In particular, really looking at students who are on free reduced lunch, we want to make sure that um, <coughs> finances are not preventing students from engaging in the playing of a musical instrument or engaging in, in sports. I've asked Jared to do a study even related to access of varsity sports and how what percentage of our students are actually playing club sports leading into varsity sports because we know the expense of club sports yeah. is pretty significant as well. And if that's a if we're building that as a requirement, we're we're forcing a lot of kids out who may not have the means to do that. So how can we change that? Um, either through our park and rec or other opportunities we may have. So we want to do the same thing around music here as well. The only thing that I would ask is if we could expand, I, I think I heard you mention performing arts, so if we could expand to performing arts and include both our music programs as well as our theater programs. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the team. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the, the final goal here, Colleen at the last board meeting shared out some of our behavioral uh, data. And so goal five, we know that students who are engaged, actively engaged, uh, positively participating in, in different elements of their education beyond the classroom, that you tend to see fewer disciplinary issues and behavioral issues. So district goal number five is reducing that time out of class reducing over-representation of students of color, students with disabilities, as seen through those behavioral incidents. Would it be helpful to have a breakdown of the males and females as well in that category? We did have some conversation. I'm trying to think who, I think it was Carrie Owens who brought that up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, Especially um, in regards to suspensions. I, I know there's some data out there about that, probably with race as well. So looking at proportionality of gender. Yes. Okay. Any questions about that second priority area? Okay. Third priority area with career pathways, you're going to see um, a little different look where rather than focusing on goals, we're focusing on some strategic, key strategic actions. And in the upper left hand corner grayed out, you see a CCR number five, YE number two, those relate to the goals that we're setting. So CCR number five would be college career readiness, goal number five. So this strategic priority or strategic action number one deals with that goal number five and then youth engagement goal number two. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So around this, this is the launch of Connect. You've heard about this in terms of that senior capstone event uh, where some courses are going to be integrated. So looking rather than at specific metrics, looking at milestones and meeting these milestones. So with the launching of Connect, promotion recruitment, having those info sessions, material and course guide. Milestone two would be registration of a student cohort as a result of that work. Milestone number three would be commitment to business mentors to work with those students who signed up. So really tracking it through those milestones and being able to share out where we are with these milestones, what some of the next steps may be after that. Along with that, um, strategic action number two would be improving the ACPs. 
and doing some work with 612 staff to understand uh, the what and why behind it a little bit strong, more strongly than we have right now. At least one activity in career cruising for all of our students. And then looking at the process articulated, implemented, every student with a state and plan for post high school. So those would be the four milestones related to that ACP process to help us move forward with that. Strategic action number three is around the attributes and working with our curriculum facilitators to revise that developmental matrix. We're going to focus this year on two attributes to solidify them. And we think that these both tie nicely into the work we're doing with social emotional learning as well, with the focus on character and citizenship just the crossover with social emotional learning and some of that equity work as well and building a greater sense of belonging um, across our grade levels and schools. So looking at that revision, then the alignment of attributes with grade level projects that they're doing with project-based learning. And what we'd like to do in 2021 is when students complete those projects, excuse me, have a badging process where if you successfully complete those projects, and we know you're learning some character, citizen traits and attributes that you get a badge for that, that we can document through either power school or some other element and then do some celebrations with students around those badging as a way to recognize and identify the development of those skills moving forward. We're anticipating developing rubrics uh, that they can choose a rubric line that aligns to an attribute within their project-based learning so then they can use the score to determine that they have met that standard within the project-based learning rubric. And that's how we'll be documenting that they didn't just have exposure, but they actually achieved it within the project work. Okay. Around service excellence, we've identified three goals. The first one is around parent survey and looking at the mean score. And then the two areas that we identified as opportunities are around receiving feedback on students' progress, receiving positive phone calls and messages. And so part of this is going to be working with the schools to identify, again, those strategic actions with some milestones that they would implement as part of their short cycle improvements. District goal number two is the percentile ranking and Entergage, which is the staff survey that we do and looking at the overall percentile score, this may change. I was talking to Julie a little bit about this and using the mean scores rather than the percentile scores. Um, but targeting the overall mean score and then looking at some of those, my manager around the culture climate um, makes it easier to do my job, helps me learn and grow, cares about my concerns. And then the third one is around the board self-assessment with that community engagement score. So while it's increased over the last three, four years from a 3.2 to a 3.46, it continues to be our lowest score on that overall self-assessment. And we've identified some strategies we're putting in place. I've shared out a calendar. Um, and so wherever you may be able to, to attend some of those PTO meetings, staff chats, and some of those other community engagement events. One thing I noticed on the calendar is um, we don't have editing rights to put our names on, or we didn't have them as of this weekend. I believe we've corrected that. Okay. So you should be able to go in I and just put your name. I through a comment. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. What, what do the staff chats look like? So the staff chats, we've done those the last three years, um, and it's really an opportunity um, to share out, I think, some of our priority work. So over the course of last year, it was sharing out really some of the referendum work that was being done, and then what some of the construction projects were going to look like and what we were hoping to do. Uh, this next year, it'll probably continue to focus on that construction calendar and any other conversation board members may want to have with staff members that we think would be important to have conversations around. So it's a four or five minute staff chat and then opening it up to questions, thoughts that they may have and taking 15 to 20 minutes at one of their staff faculty meetings. And then I usually hang around to listen to the remaining agenda items. So, um, And then around strategic action, then around service excellence, 
Uh, one, in order to target the youth engagement goal number five, uh, Jonathan's already worked with the bus drivers to do some training, and so we've already started to do some strategic action around that one. Around um, service excellence, goal number two, uh, working with the leadership team to use our um, improvement tactics consistently to build that culture, so we're doing daily completion of I Am Grateful Four cards, where the goal is at least once a day you're filling this out and giving it to a staff member, student, um, whoever it may be, um, sharing um, their success. We're also doing 30-day conferences with new staff, 90-day conferences with new staff, just as a check-in. Is this what you thought it was going to be? And um, what can we do to help you continue to learn and grow? And then are there opportunities that you can bring in from your previous organization here into our district that could help improve who we are. So those are the conversations after the 30, 90 day. The rounding is really a check-in, a short check-in with staff members where you're getting a sense of how things are going, what's a challenge, and it could be something as simple as, I've got a couple of lights in my room that need to be taken care of. And I've asked now a couple of times and they're, they're still not taken care of. And then from that, the administrative team members will be putting together a stoplight report, sort of a red, yellow, green, red, we haven't gotten to it or we can't get to it and here's why, yellow, we're working on it, green, we've, we've accomplished this and we've solved this problem for you. And then the final one is that development and sharing of the stoplight report so that we can hold each, our, each other collectively accountable for moving forward with these tactics. John? My brother's a middle school principal in Kettle Marine, and he does the rounding. And one thing he, he showed me his uh, template. And one thing he adds is um, what what staff member would you like to recognize and why? Yeah. So that's and one of the, the questions. The data that he well. gathers yeah. is in incredible. Like, oh, my gosh. I did, we're not using the, this person as a resource in B, B, and C. Right. And that, that then can lead to that I am grateful for card. Sure where you can send that out or manage up and even include that person who shared that and make a comment, well, John told me about this that you're doing. I really appreciate you going above and beyond. Right. It's really helping John out this way, right? So mm -hmm. it, it acknowledges both those staff members for a job well done. So that's part of the rounding process as Great. well. So thank you for pointing that out. Around facility efficiency and cleanliness, uh, Brian and Kitty are going to be working on developing a process for cleaning classrooms and completing work orders for both IT and for maintenance, communication to staff about those processes, and then developing a cleanliness responsiveness survey so we can start gathering some feedback related to that, and then piloting that with a group of teachers, see what sort of feedback we get. If we need to make some tweaks to that, we can, otherwise we can move forward with even some improvements around those processes related to the survey that we're getting. And then the final one here, a mentoring program for paraprofessionals. So Julie's worked on this to launch it this year. We're going to work before the next meeting to put in those milestones for you. And then the final strategic action, number five, implementation of parent communication tactics to provide feedback, positive communication. So looking at building that as well with the administrative team, with the principals on what those milestones will be related to that as well. So that's what we are proposing as the scorecard. The weights then that you see is college career readiness at 30%, youth engagement at 30%, and then the career pathway work at 20%, and the service excellence at 20%. So greater focus on some of those student goals than on some of the staff goals. One um, question I had around this was, or maybe even a, an idea, project-based learning is a great example. So that's one of our strategic priorities as a district. And it's woven throughout, so it's hard to pick out how much we're actually putting an emphasis on that. So would it make sense to highlight that when you're looking at the, for example, the clear part of it is on youth engagement is where that first goal was moved. And so you, you know, I always do the math on accident here. 
So I was looking at this, and I'm okay, there's four pieces of this. There's 20, well, 24 criteria. So you start to break it down, and you think, okay, that's the percentage of, of priority that that is, which isn't true because it's woven into right over here where you have a PBL survey. It's woven over here where you have this going on. I know from my perspective, it would just be kind of interesting and maybe even just saying, like, how is that, how are all those different strategic priorities, what percentage of the total does that kind of uh, encompass across the, uh, the scorecard? And it also might be interesting as you're doing that because you know, some of these have eight different milestones, which are very similar in aspect, and so they're counted eight times versus this one has three, and so there's only a weight of three out of 20. I don't want to get caught up on the numbers here, but I just think it's interesting to see where do, what does that actually break down to under the percentage of each one of those different areas? And is that where we want it to be? Or do we maybe need to roll some of those milestones together to say, you know, this one and this one are, should be achieved to equal that milestone or something? So not adding more, oh. it's just kind of figuring out, is it the right balance? And it's a little bit hard to tell right now just because of the way you can look at the big buckets here, but one of our strategic priorities is kind of woven through, so what does that actually equal? One thought I have in response to that is you could make, um, we could make these um, must-haves, right? So somehow indicate on here that mm -hmm. we, we need to hit that target, right? The, we're going we're gonna to pull this one out as one of the 20 indicators, and we're going to look at this one in isolation as a must-have because it is part of our priority work. So we, we could do something like that. Um, otherwise, if you wanted to sit down with me, Thor, and look at some of these percentages, and w we could even develop something moving forward that we could share with the board at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. I think that what you're getting at is the indicators here seem to be acceptable. It's how are we weighting them and giving priority to certain elements here over others. Yeah. So I, how I do we how do we weight those priorities a little bit more than some of these other pieces? And I think it would be an interesting visual from a stoplight pr perspective too. And I can share what we do, for example, with our grant management. We use a stoplight program, um, and I can look really quickly and say I have eight percent of my grants are red. Okay, I want to figure out what's going on over here. Here's the ones that are yellow. Here's the ones that are green. Um, you can break that up, you know, by dollar amount. You can break it up by number of grant, you know. So there's some simple ways to kind of build a little, if you're using Excel or whatever, build a little dashboard on top to look at that quickly and say if this is this, this equals that. And that might be helpful to us too, and I'm assuming it would be helpful to the district as you're in real time updating this on a quarterly basis. All right, we want to dive in a little bit deeper here. Right. Or we're looking really good here. Let's, you know, give ourselves the appropriate pats on the back that we deserve <laughs> and then con and continued encouragement so does that make sense to the other board members are you comfortable if yeah. Thor and I get together and look at that and propose some weights around there's that a different way of slicing it a little bit sure right, right. Yeah. okay yeah. any other questions or comments all right then um, as I mentioned we'll bring this back at our next board meeting to approve um, for our 2019-2020 school year. All right, continuing on, the next item on the agenda, uh, we'll take both item 5.4 and 5.5 together. It's annual meeting planning in the budget. So um, on September 16th, we will have our annual meeting. Uh, this is a yearly requirement the state uh, expects of school districts. And we use this as a way to share our budget, uh, our priorities, as well as highlight some things. So we'll review the the agenda and then talk a little bit about the budget that that will be happening so the agenda you see we'll start with the budget hearing at 6 30 on Monday the 16th so that's a little bit earlier than our typical time and then at seven no earlier than seven o'clock we will start our um, annual meeting so dr. Kills is there anything else that you want to share about the agenda we will again have um, some of our students performing the national anthem I believe it's going to be the choir, Marianne, is that correct? The choir. I believe we have the choir that's going to be coming uh, to perform the national anthem. Uh, in terms of commendations, we have four individuals who are going to be receiving the 2019 Advocates of Greendale Education Awards. They're individuals who have helped us with some of the equity work, so Drs. Mutri, Dr. Smith, 
and then Jim Bartol Stashel Young, who helped connect us with mm -hmm. Community Builders uh, Workshop and, and brought that forward for us and participated in that. So all uh, three out of the four have already expressed that they're going to be there. Looking forward to uh, being part of our annual meeting. We also, as a new addition on here that Jonathan brought forward for our attention, is item number 10. One of the motions we have to make is to authorize the payment of actual necessary expenses of, of a school board member when traveling in the performance of the duties. So what we need to do, and it's probably been a while since this has been on the agenda, um, so we want to make sure that we're bringing it back again at least every couple of years in order to make sure that the community is approving your travel expenses to go to conferences, to go to the workshops. So we've put that on this year. Uh, just to get that community support for your continued professional development as board members. Can you clarify, are they approving actual expenses or they're just approving the, the idea? Of they're approving the idea. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. so, so agenda item nine is the, the approval of the board's salary of, of, you know, we're continuing to maintain it at $4,200 annually. And then in addition to approving that, they approve the idea that the district will reimburse school board members for the continuing education, mm -hmm. um, the professional development. Probably, I'm assuming we'll have kind of previous numbers on that if, for the, okay. if there are questions. Yeah. Yes. All right, any questions on the agenda item? All right, and then uh, Jonathan, you want to share a little bit about the, the annual meeting, so, mm -hmm. uh, or, or the budget. So if you think about it, we approved a preliminary budget back in June because July 1 starts our fiscal year. We go to the community to get an advisory vote on the approval of that budget, and things have changed a little bit, and you outlined it. And then at the end of October, we will approve as a board the final budget. Mm -hmm. So John's going, Jonathan's going to explain a little bit about this advisory vote um, from the community and what we're presenting, um, where, where the budget that we're presenting next month fits into what we've already approved mm -hmm. and what we'll approve at the end of October. That was a good, good preview, thank you. <laughs> um, so um, as you stated, we've had some, some um, larger changes um, in terms of the state budget being finalized, um, in terms of there being some open enrollment seats that were approved in that June board meeting. And since we've had um, almost all of those seats filled, so reflecting the revenues for that. Um, also, you know, we have a good problem in that our um, resident enrollment is increasing. And so we talked earlier about some of the staffing modifications that we've made um, to reflect that. Um, the last piece is, is that we are making final connections um, for fiber internet um, to, to the, the high school location um, for our buildings in the district. And so we wanna update the budget from June to reflect those things um, and have that be the budget that's discussed um, in the budget hearing where we would get the advisory vote of the community um, on that. There will be some factors that will still change after the annual meeting because we'll have our third Friday um, pupil count will come and our final state aid figure will come. We know the structure of that based on the, the state budget, but we'll need those additional factors to get final um, budgetary numbers. Um, but making these modifications now, I think makes it more accurate to where we are um, for the, the budget that's being discussed by the community. It's still a balanced budget um, in, our, in our operational fund um, and um, provided a copy of that for the board's review here tonight. So you see in the cover memo the, the general operating fund, <laughs> the revenue and expenses are being reduced by that $213,000 and then the community service fund uh, is being reduced by that $47,500. Are those reductions tied to any specific line item or any specific um, program or staff that, that we may have approved mm -hmm. earlier and now we've made a different determination in the last couple of months? Or is it just kind of the overall, some of the assumptions may have changed? I mean, th these changes are pretty small when you're talking about a $35 million budget. Sure. Just, sure. Again, just curious, are they tied to a specific 
program or a specific item or, or a specific okay. individual? So I think with the staffing changes, you can point to the increased enrollment. You talked about kindergarten mm -hmm. positions, and so two full-time positions there. There's also some um, other modifications within paraprofessionals and other teaching staff positions where we may have had to bump up um, an FTE position at a high school level to create an additional section um, for an item. So um, it has to do with actual enrollment um, to date and that we made some modifications that are different from what we originally projected um, from the staffing side um, within our operating budget. Within our community service fund, we're looking at um, our, our projected numbers for the additional police liaison officer being slightly less um, than when we projected and a couple other positions where we take a look at that budget and really trying to be tight um, with that because we know that there's going to be a significant um, increase to that community service levy, um, but we want to be really conscientious to the community and taxpayers about, about that. So we've just tried to tighten it up um, as much as possible now that we've seen the year-end 18-19 figures that we can do some better projections than we may have been able to do um, in the early springtime when that budget was first developed. Any other questions or, or comments? All right, so then um, I don't think we approve the, the agenda or the budget or anything. I, I think based on this conversation, mm -hmm. this is what will then go out and be communicated to the staff. I think we saw where, or not the staff, but the community, I think we saw where um, this will be included with um, some of the communication that goes out to all community members in advance of that meeting. Right. I know Kitty has sent the annual report to the printer, and that's going to be mailed week of Labor Day so that our community members have notice of the annual meeting through that annual report. So they'll see it twice in their homes. Okay. All right. Is there any thought about putting it on, getting it on the marquee? That might be something with the village to consider. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. Continuing on then, uh, student board member report. Emma, anything to report on day one of the 2019-2020 yes, school year? Report. Lots of fun stuff. Well, today was the first day of school. Um, football game on Thursday, so that's exciting. We have a Greendale Spirit Day. Um, girls Varsity Tennis had their first match on Saturday. Fall play auditions are starting next week, as well as G Harmony auditions, and band season is in full swing. Um, going back a month or so, Teens with Impact members attended the Seaburn Goodman Teen Institute in Illinois. Um, it was about 15 people, and there they got to grow their leadership skills and receive teen mental health first aid training through the Born This Way Foundation in partnership with Johns Hopkins University. And so that was really exciting for the group, and we definitely got to bring back a lot of really awesome ideas through that. Um, during six September, which is Suicide Prevention Month, they plan to launch a, progr launch a program called Find Your Anchor, which provides resources for individuals who have depression or um, also anxiety. And like while developing that program, sorry, um, we used resources from Johns Hopkins University and the liaison or representative from Johns Hopkins that we got to work with at our camp. Um, the first meeting for the student equity team is September 6th. Um, where we will be meeting with Dr. Mutri and Dr. Smith again, and there we plan to open applications for all members and in order to create a more inclusive and representative group. Um, and also at that meeting, they plan to look for a possible synergy with other student groups such as Black Student Alliance, International Club, and the United Students Association. And then also we're going to start working on the um, We Belong campaign that Sources of Strength um, kind of has outlined for us. Um, I think that's all I've got. 
that's a lot for day one. <laughs> <laughs> we can't wait to ha hear what happens I was next month. Up a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, um, John. Legislative update. Uh, yeah, I came across some research, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody here, uh, that passing a funding uh, referendum boosts test scores, college enrollment, and reduces dropout rates in Wisconsin. It was an interesting study where they uh, compared districts where referendums failed, where referendums uh, succeeded. And another interesting part, I thought, was that the effect was greatest after 10 years. Um, the extra money went specifically to teacher pay and reduced staff-student ratio. So fairly intuitive, but uh, I like that there was numbers towards what I'm sure nearly everybody here believes in. Um, the Senate Education Committee met recently, and they uh, discussed, and it appears they are likely to vote on a change in fire drills. The current law is that there c can be no previous warning, but what was discussed was uh, it may be in the best interest of some pupils at school. Uh, you can think of students who uh, have uh, emotional needs or uh, other students that they will be able to be notified in rare cases. So it's still in committee. The full Senate, I'm sure, will vote on that soon. Yeah. Thank you for that Green update. Schedule. Until they get back in session, thank you for that update. Any board committee updates? Anything from Park and Rec or? Uh, oh, go ahead. No. I OK. All right, I'll go. Um, just want to remind everyone that the WASB fall um, meeting is going to be in October. And I was looking here for the date. I don't see it right now. But um, that will be on a weeknight at the um, Holiday Inn in Pewaukee. And it's usually a dinner and meeting together. Um, also, there is a workshop that's being offered about strategies to retain and compensate teachers. And that's on Tuesday, October 29th from 4.30 to 6. So, but um, I think you guys all got the information on the fall meeting, right? Yes. Yes. The, the regional meeting, yep. Park and Rec, a couple quick items. One was um, their 17th and final benefit auction is coming up. So November 2nd, 2019. Put on your calendars, Muskego Lakes Country Club. And uh, the other uh, news that you may have already seen is that Mamma Mia is going to be the production coming with the Greendale Community Theater. So I know they have open additions and other things going on with that. So more to come. Stay tuned to Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots going on. All right, thank you. Any other committee updates? All right, um, board calendar review. Anything on the calendar that's coming up? Um, that we should be aware of. I, I know the, the village is going to have the, f the Oktoberfest and a, a fall festival, and Tripborn Farms is, is having um, a, a, a um, craft fair mm -hmm. um, in the next couple of months. Anything else that we should be aware of that we're, we're thinking of? As Emma mentioned, the first football game is Thursday night. Should be a good one. Um, so Lake Geneva Badger. Lake Geneva? Alrighty, then we are at the end of our agenda. Uh, any additional comments from visitors this evening? Good evening. Oops. Matt Godley. Um, I just actually am seeing this sign. There to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, the board a few months ago began to broadcast and video record its meetings on the district's YouTube channel. This is a valuable service that brings Greendale up to standards of transparency and engagement set by several peer districts, such as Franklin, Whitnall, West Dallas, West Milwaukee, Kenosha, and of course, MPS. These districts have long made meeting videos available in real time and as an archive. The practice also allowed uh, people who are unable to attend in person to watch in real time or later on, and thus to stay up to date with the district's management and activities, as well, of course, as the democratic interaction of the board with parents, taxpayers, and other stakeholders. A few days ago, when I was looking for a video of a GHS band practice, which of course I realized has its own separate channel, I was surprised to notice that these videos have been taken down and that in fact the entire Greendale School's YouTube channel uh, appears as disabled. Obviously, this is a disappointing retreat from the transparency and effective communication you previously uh, embraced, and it deprives the board and the district of an effective means of outreach and publicity to students, parents, Greendale as a whole, and the wider community. I hope that the camera 
indicates that this is just a technical glitch and not a retreat from this transparency and that uh, maybe even right away could reassure me that this practice will be restored. That's, I just wanted to know that. I appreciate you bringing that up. Kitty, please, yes. It appears it's back. <laughs> Maybe I can I'm respond not. to that. I just found about that out myself earlier this week. Well, actually, it would have been later last week. Um, YouTube, actually, because they're owned by Google, Google is changing some of the formatting of its Google for Education and having the YouTube site as a branded account because we are considered a branded account is no longer feasible. So I am working on a workaround. I have to apply for a unsuspension of our account which I will be doing as soon as I can. I, I need to c confirm with tech which of our email addresses it is affiliated with. And then we expect that we will be unsuspended. And then we have to reestablish a YouTube account, but with a different email address. Does that make sense? So it's a little bit of a workaround. And I thank you for, for bringing that to our attention that you noticed it. That means that people are actually looking at our YouTube, which I track on a regular basis. So thank you very much. And I am working on it. I apologize for not letting you all know about that when I found out last week. All right, thanks for that clarification. A anything else? I, I know we kind of interrupted you. Anything else from your comment? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Then um, we are adjourned, and our next board meeting is uh, on September 9th, so it is the second Monday because of Labor Day. <laughs>